Hello and welcome to the webinar, Oil and Gas Majors in Floating Wind. I'm Luke Brett from Reuters Events, currently focusing on offshore and floating wind projects. This is one of several pieces of work we're doing for the industry, uh, as well as offshore and floating wind virtual, a free to attend virtual conference this October 1st and 2nd. There are over 1,800 of you signed up today, which is phenomenal. Thanks so much for the great response and to our panelists uh, for their time. Just a brief bit of housekeeping before we get, begin. This webinar will last an hour and is being recorded. So we will send you the full audio recordings and presentations within a week or so. You do have the facility to ask questions through the question box. Now, without further ado, uh, Paul Hidegeis uh, from Quest FWE will be moderating. Paul, do make an introduction. Thank you, Luke. Um, it's my pleasure uh, and uh, to join with Reuters events in this live podcast. Uh, we thank you for the inv invitation to collaborate. Uh, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel. Joining us today are Arna Eck, Lead Business Development, Offshore Wind at Equinor, James Cotter, General Manager, Offshore Wind Americas at Shell, and Knut Vesbotten, Head of Business Development, Floating Wind at Acre Solutions. Um, I'm going to present a market outlook uh, for the first uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to segue immediately into the moderated panel discussion, and uh, we'll entertain your questions during that time as well. Uh, just a reminder, there'll be forward-looking statements here, and future results and developments may change from what's uh, stated here. Environmental, social, and governance are permanent fixtures. These policies are key drivers influencing our energy transition. The companies shown have been transparent about their net zero carbon emissions commitment and remain at the forefront of many of their peers. I take this opportunity to quote BP's CEO, Bernard Looney. The technologies required to reach, each, reach net zero exist today. The challenge is to use them at pace and scale. Also, two American companies, Ford and Amazon, recently took the pledge. Uh, later in the moderated panel discussion, we'll lead with the respective panelists' companies' uh, goals in this area. Wind has grown to represent about 50% of renewables generation over the last several years. Renewable energy led by wind and solar power increased by a record amount in 2019 accounting for over 40% of their growth in primary energy. In 2019, wind was the largest contributor to growth in electricity generation, outpacing solar. Over the next decade, offshore wind, bottom fixed and floating, will become one of the most competitive sources of electricity, commensurate with fossil fuels, solar PV, and onshore wind. Offshore wind holds enormous potential. The offshore wind segment is projected to become a $10 trillion industry within a decade. This slide illustrates the potential installed capacity additions in gigawatts for offshore wind across key regions. The gold circles indicate 2030 projections and the blue ovals 2040. Europe, China, and the USA are the fastest growth areas and together represent about three quarters of the total. Major capacity additions to 2040 outlined in blue signal a very clear marker for exponential growth in offshore wind with the ex expectation for large contributions from floating wind specifically, where Euro Europe and Asia will play a key role. More on that later. Climate ambitions coupled with attractive regulatory frameworks and lower cost of capital are lifting renewable spend potentially to one to two trillion per annum. Green energy investing will account for about one quarter of all energy spending in 2021, according to a recent Goldman Sachs study. In fact, this will be the first time that renewables will outpace oil and gas spend. This tremendous momentum and accelerated spend for green energy will lead to stronger job growth. A recent McKinsey study shown highlights the creation of 75 jobs for every 10 million spend compared to 27 jobs in oil and gas. For those less familiar, I've included this slide as a reminder of the sheer scale of the latest generation 15 megawatt turbines, which reach heights comparable to the Shard in London. 
This is just one element of the overall complexity to large offshore wind parks, a technology which should be applauded for its innovations. As indicated on this map, floating wind is a young industry with 15 units currently online, representing nine projects and a decade of work. Equinor has designed and developed six of these, while Acre Solutions Principal Power have deployed four, Ideal 2, IHI, Mitsui, and Toda have produced one design each installed off Japan. This map highlights the currently identified outlook for floating wind projects by status. Shown in dark blue are the smaller volume of underdevelopment projects slated for commissioning to 2027. Denoted in gold are the planned projects, a growing share of the total units now 20%. The largest share of possible projects indicated in dark red Regionally, Europe and Asia Pacific comprise nearly 65% of the total floating wind units in our forecast. The opportunity pipeline for floating wind continues to gain momentum. In this year over year comparison, number of projects are up 39%, number of units have gained 23%, and total megawatts have risen 40% to 21.2 gigawatts. Shown is the review of underdevelopment projects to 2027, citing 19 projects comprising 141 floating turbine units, representing an installed capacity of 1.2 gigawatts. These projects represent 5.3 billion in CapEx, with 60% allocated to projects to be delivered between 2022 and 2026. On the left, regionally, distribution is shown as two-thirds Asia Pacific and one-third Europe, mainly France, Norway, and Spain. The largest of these projects shown, top, middle, blue, green, and gray, are the big three in South Korea. KF Win, principal power wind float design and development led by the EDPR NGJV with Ocker and Korean wind, Donghae Twin Win, an innovative hexacon design with deployment Development led by Shell and Cohen, Cohen's Hexacon. And Donghai One, led by developers Equinor, KNOC, and EWP. Next, a review of contracts, awards, and deliveries. Shown left is a visual for the floating substructure, contracts, awards, and deliveries as highlighted in gold. Note all but three of these contracts are awarded as indicated by the left portion of the bar sequence, a narrow nub. The right portion of the bar sequence for each row denotes the project execution phase with projected fabrication timeline shown. As you can see, the bulk of these are in the execution phase over the next 18 months. The contract awards illustrated in blue right denote the total capex for these 19 projects, inclusive of all supply chain segments from engineering to fabrication to moorings, power cables, and installation. We estimate that about one and a half billion has already been spent over the last 24 months or contracted, let, with an additional 1.4 billion to 2022 and another 1.3 billion to 2024. From that point, contracts will surge from the sanctioning of currently identified projects. We'll touch on that next. Here's a closer look of what I mean. An analysis of the total offshore wind market incorporating both bottom fixed and floating reveals about 200 billion in contract awards over the next five years with a 43% share to turbines, a third to substructures, 13 to cables, and the balance to the segments shown. Meanwhile, floating only contract awards over the next five years projected at 33 billion with a distribution by major supply chain segment shown right. Now an in-depth look at these contracts and more. Shown by project status indicates the significance of planned in gold and possible in red projects as the pace of floating wind project sanctions potentially quickly accelerate quadrupling in 2023 to 16 billion compared to 14 billion in 2021. A cumulative view of floating wind to 2023, 2033 shows a total addressable market of over 70 billion comprised of identified, mostly named projects shown with statuses under development, planned and possible. Half of these as measured in number of projects lie in Europe, 
30% in Asia Pacific, 18% in the Americas. You know, distribution wise, Asia leads the earlier years here. Both Europe, with both Europe and USA gaining in later years here. So far, we've showed you projected activity over the next 10 to 12 years. But what about a bolder prediction, prediction to say 2050? I ask you to ponder what could be the ultimate potential for floating wind. The ultimate possibilities are truly awe-inspiring to me and ultimately, ultimately, who knows, there's a possibility of floating domination. And in megawatt terms, a fourfold increase potentially in capacity additions beyond 2035 to 2050, possibly reaching 180 gigawatts Shown right by our estimates with the bar, top bar of this line, this would necessitate nearly 13,000 floating turbine units by 2050. Now we'd like to segue into our uh, moderated panel discussion. Gentlemen, thanks for uh, listening to the presentation and audience, thank you. Uh, we tried to keep it brief, but also try to cover um, uh, various uh, things. Um, just to start off, we see ourselves transitioning. Gentlemen, your companies have all been transparent about their 2050 climate ambitions and have set aggressive net zero emissions targets. James, please tell us about Shell's plan and your new energy units targets for clean energies into the future. Sure. Thanks, Paul, for the, uh, for the overview and the intro. Um, first, I'd like to put it in a little bit of context. Energy, light, heat, cools our homes and businesses. It transports and connects people and goods. It's used in industrial processes to create a steel and cement for the world's infrastructure. Energy use goes hand in hand with economic activity. I think it's fair to say that the energy uh, has shaped our history and certainly energy will shape our future too. But we in society face a dual challenge. How do we make a transition to a low carbon energy future to manage the risk of climate change while also extending the benefits of energy to everyone on the planet? We believe that this is an achievable ambition and that requires changes in the way that energy is produced, used and made accessible to ever more people while drastically cutting the emissions as we really need to. In April, Shell significantly raised our ambition in relation to climate change with the aim to be a net zero emissions energy business by 2050 or sooner. This will of course play out in different ways across our portfolio over a long period of time. I should say that we continue to see a role for oil and gas in the future energy mix as some sectors of the economy will continue to rely on hydrocarbons for the foreseeable future. We aim to make power a significant business for Shell. This requires being involved at almost every stage of the process from generating electricity through wind and solar to buying and selling it to supplying it directly to consumers and customers. It also requires investing further into our renewables energies portfolio, such as floating wind, to keep delivering the products consumers want and need. A need is really important. The energy transition will change our relationship with energy of that, I have no doubt. Uh, but also it's about providing a system of low carbon energy that can service the demand. Less about single assets in isolation, less about a single offshore wind farm producing when it can. Far more about generation combined with energy vectors such as hydrogen, storage, either centralized or distributed um, within portfolios, working with demand profiling through customer digitization or load management to provide low carbon energy to the right place, importantly, at the right time. It really is a global challenge that requires solutions that go down to the very local level. So in summary, for Shell, we're significantly raising our net carbon footprint ambition. Our medium term ambition will be to reduce our net carbon footprint for the energy products we sell by 30% by 2035. Our long term, long -term ambition is 65% by 2050. Aiming to be net zero on all emissions from the manufacture of all of our products, including non-energy products by 2050 at the latest. This includes our operational emissions and the emissions associated with energy that we consume through those operations. Offshore floating wind has the ability to help us with that, with island generation for our assets. Wind is critical to our ambitions to grow a low, lower carbon power business. 
It enables Shell to generate renewable electricity in different parts of the world at scale and also at focus points. If you combine our operational and pipeline developments, including our leases, currently we have more than five gigawatts. We are looking to further expand. Shell has a long and proud history in offshore engineering in harsh marine environments and with floating assets. 50 years of experience in deep water uh, oil and gas in the North Sea 40 in the Gulf of Mexico. We see many places these capabilities can be transferred to offshore wind, both by ourselves, our partners and the supply chain partners that we work with, and especially towards floating offshore wind. We believe that by working with the wider industry and supply chain, we can transition this experience into the successful delivery and commercialization with industrialization of floating offshore wind projects, but specifically to answer a demand for the customer need. That's excellent, James. Thanks for putting that in context for us. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot there, of course. Uh, it's a it's a full vision and uh, many background. moving parts. <laughs> Arne Ecuador was an early adapter of carbon capture, storage, and strategies and, re and reduce carbon emissions targets. Please update us on Ecuador's clean energy pursuit. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. And also, thank you, James, for, for introducing the uh, energy transition issues. That's, uh, that's highly, highly important here. So, so from our point of view, we, uh, we have said that we will reduce the, the, the carbon content of our products with 50% uh, over time. And in order to do that, we will de definitely have uh, several tools in the toolbox. Uh, you mentioned uh, carbon capture and, uh, and storage. Hydrogen is also very important. Obviously, reducing emissions from our own operation is part of that uh, picture. And, and importantly, we have stated that we, we are going to be a global major within offshore wind with an ambition of uh, uh, equity ambition of four to six gigawatt by 2026 and 12 to 16 gigawatt by 2035. And finally, and of course relevant for the discussion today, we are very clear that we like to maintain a world leading position within, uh, within floating offshore wind. So uh, several things to focus on and uh, obviously floating offshore wind is a, is a key part for us. Excellent. Um, I'd like to move on to the uh, industrialization category, and uh, you've already mentioned a bit of that, uh, starting with James. Arna, what are Equinor's next steps towards commercial scale and deployment of floating wind capital projects? And describe your journey to derive meaningful cost reductions. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, I always like to say that this is not Equinor's journey. This is the whole industry's journeys. We are seeing more and more companies coming in, we see more and more developers coming in. We're also seeing the oil and gas and majors coming in, and that's really needed. We need many excellent players in this uh, in this field in order to succeed in the way with floating offshore wind, as we have succeed with bottom fixed uh, um, uh, offshore wind. So in terms of uh, uh, how we're thinking, I mean, we, we have high in Scotland uh, in operation for almost three years now. It's the best performing offshore wind uh, uh, facility in the UK uh, and the next project for us will be the high wind tamp and 88 megawatt coming on the line in 2022 and cost reduction is very important we see a 40 percent cost reduction from high wind Scotland to a high wind tamp and then for our next project which we think will be somewhere between 250 and 500 megawatts we will see at least another 30 percent cost reductions so this is happening very, very quickly. And maybe we could even say that the costs are coming down faster within floating offshore wind as we've seen in, in bottom fix. And if, if, if so, that's, this is very, very good news. That's encouraging, um, Arna. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Knut, Ocker Solutions is uniquely positioned as both a developer of offshore wind and having a strong per technology portfolio. Walk us through this dual approach. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be in such a distinguished panel, and uh, and thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity. We um, we see that uh, floating wind is uh, has an enormous potential. We see that um, the projects um, are uh, coming, uh, and we um, see that the industry is uh, starting to get ready to scale up. 
So looking back at the journey that uh, Bottle Fix has had, uh, it's probably taken some uh, 20 years to uh, to get the significant volume in place. Some uh, more, some more than uh, 30 gigawatts installed, and uh, and we see that today the uh, floating piece is uh, very small, uh, with less than uh, 100 megawatts uh, installed uh, globally. Um, but we we see that uh, there is an increase, and whether that increase is uh, by 100 or by 200 by by 2030, it's uh, it's difficult to say. But uh, the potential is really there. Uh, so when we um, when we uh, started looking at the uh, offshore wind piece again some five years ago, we saw that uh, we had a differentiating position in uh, uh, particularly in floating. And um, we uh, we looked at developing concepts ourselves, and then we, we found that uh, there was a concept uh, that was developed that uh, very much looked similar to what we've delivered in in the oil and gas space for uh, 50 years. So we we bought into principal power, and uh, and that's been a fantastic uh, story so far. Uh, but uh, the reality is that in the supply chain, there isn't an awful lot of contracts of scale now being uh, awarded. So, um, so we like to use our capability and uh, and our knowledge of uh, deep waters in order to ensure that uh, this industry is uh, able to scale up uh, as fast as I think uh, we need um, in terms of supplying the energy of uh, of preference. And um, the, we've uh, we've then been uh, given a few opportunities to to um, develop projects uh, in. Uh, in various countries, and um, and we really see that uh, having that experience is uh, helping our developer arm to uh, ensure that uh, projects are going to be delivered in uh, in line with the cost reductions that uh, this industry industry needs, and that of course goes beyond the floater; it goes through the entire uh, system, through the uh, substation, whether that be floating, bottom fixed, or uh, subsea as well as high voltage dynamic cable so it's uh, along along the full the full line of uh, of products absolutely and that's that's a very good point uh james uh please describe describe shell's unique approach to innovating and floating wind technology through both acquisitions and partnerships that you've made what's your progress to date and next steps to scale so yeah i think i think that's uh a really interesting kind of question and to to follow on from Knut. Um, really it's about the whole system and it's about the system thinking but to, to innovate I think there's there's two perceptions around innovation one is it can be high risk and and the other is that you really have to do something new um, but but for me um, innovation is, is merely questioning the perceived logic uh, or, or looking at how you can apply experience into a new area or a new, a different setting and, and floating offshore wind and oil and gas background for me comes together well. So I think, I think what's really important is that, that we as a, uh, an industry come together and have uh, or, or, or be able to describe what our compelling future is um, because really to be able to innovate successfully across a system everyone has to be working towards the same compelling future and that, that really needs some imagination. I mean, I, for me personally, I think the ability to deliver low carbon energy to meet customer demand through the commercialization of offshore wind, be it fixed or floating, I, I don't see it as fixed versus floating. I see the advancement of our ability to deliver in different water depths, in different conditions in the best possible way. If you look back at the bottom fix, uh, industry it's very much characterized from monopiles and the installation of monopiles and a lot of the field development that we see in lease areas are driven by effectively shallow water depths that we can get um, that kind of equipment in so it's very much you know if we try to take the approach that we use in bottom fix offshore wind and then apply it to floating we're, we're really missing the trick the trick is how do we create the value and how do we deliver value through floating offshore wind in different supply chains using existing supply chains that work in different uh, industries and bringing it together. Now, once, once you have that compelling future for, for Shell, it's about then understanding what paths and possible pathways that you can have to get to that future. And, and we try and back as many as we can because if you restrict yourself to one route through, it's likely that you'll hit roadblocks or it's likely you'll hit challenges that you just can't get around. Um, so, it's so really we're, good. Uh, sorry? That's a really good point. 
Yeah, and oh, it's it's a really important point of you know we don't see that it will be one foundation technology, one export uh, uh, type. It will be one substation sort of design, or you know it there will be a smorgasbord of successful designs that you can use. And and the fact that there's competition will help us to continue uh, to select the right technology um, moving forwards. Um, and success is bringing all of that together with value at the centre of it. Not capex, not opex. We talk about cost reduction. Can you, I think you mentioned cost reduction. Incredibly important. It's a cost reduction to the system um, is the important part. Not just the cheapest per megawatt hour. It's around how do we make sure that megawatt hour is produced at the right time in the right place. Um, to be used effectively. So in 2015, we partnered up with Principal Power, already been mentioned in cooperation agreement for the further development of their semi-sub uh, wind concept, uh, which is one of the leading concepts today. Um, we've significantly grown our floating wind activities with floating offshore demonstrated projects with Makani, uh, which is completed ongoing for Tetra Spa with Seasdale Offshore Technologies and Energy. Uh, we collaborate more widely, bringing the industry forward. Our, our participation in the, the floating wind jip, for example, managed by the Carbon Trust, is investigating the challenges and opportunities of developing commercial scale floating offshore wind farms through ongoing projects um, you know, of access, yield, moorings, heavy lift maintenance, tow to port maintenance, dynamic cables, monitoring and inspections. And it comes back to, I think a lot of the focus is always on the foundation, the foundation technology. That's one part of the, 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 the system that we need to, to ensure works, certainly if we want to be able to commercialize it. Thanks, James. And lastly, I think, you know, from Michelle's perspective, we, we uh, through our acquisition with AOFI, we've acquired a dedicated team of floating wind development experts um, and a pilot project off the, the French coast, for Brilliant. example, which complements our South Korean activities. Excellent. Um, Canute. Um, you're in a unique position as a developer and a, a rich technology solutions tier one supplier in Ocker Solutions. What do you think about James, uh, what has James has said about their approach of not just focusing on one foundation, but looking at, you know, all the various technologies. Uh, you're kind of, you're kind of wearing both hats. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I um, I think it's uh, it's very good that um, there are um, companies that are addressing uh, various technologies. There, um, we're probably now in a in a position where there are more demonstration projects coming into play, and uh, and that's very good. Um, and then we will see when this uh, industry growth grows that uh, there uh, will be fewer. Uh, whether that selection process will happen uh, uh, right uh, in a couple of years or uh, later on, it's a little bit early to say, but, uh, but that will definitely come. And then, and then we are um, comfortable, but still humble in, uh, in, the, um, in the project that uh, we've invested in with the Prince of Power. We see that uh, they now have a leading uh, technology, but uh, with all the uh, all the new concepts coming in there they need to be uh, or we need to be uh, to be um, looking at how we industrialize that and how we bring costs down and how we improve our concept because because uh, they it isn't going to be uh, an easy ride uh, going into the future with a current 50 percent uh, uh, market cap uh, that's that's going to be challenged that is probably going to be, uh, be be changed uh, so it's it's um, I think it's interesting to see that uh, there are new concepts coming in but um, um, when um, when costs are going to be taken out the the key is to uh, re uh, to increase the um, uh, megawatts per tur turbine and the size of the field and those those are the two uh, the two key points that that we are addressing in order to ensure that you're delivering the projects of uh, of 500 megawatt or gigawatts, and uh, and you have the the entire system covered. Uh, so um, I think um, summarizing, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's good that there are new new concepts coming in, but uh, but we will quite quickly see uh, that they will come into uh, a position where there is a selected few. Whether that will be three or five or ten is probably too early to say, but uh, I think yeah that time will come pretty soon. There's no doubt that there's a, a handful of uh, designer um, designers uh, that are ahead of, of, of many of the others. Um, 
Arna, uh, I'd like to get into a discussion a bit about key markets for floating wind. Uh, what key markets are priorities for Equinor? You know, I'm sitting here with some great friends and competitors. So I would say uh, maybe Switzerland, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, they, no, won't uh, they won't let us in the EU right now. It's an American side. They could say yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like the America's Cup, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's true. No, uh, I don't think uh, it's a secret for, for anyone that uh, we are we have uh, high ambitions in, in South Korea. We hope to see uh, things more coming in, in Scotland and we also see now Norway opening up and, uh, and hopefully we can, uh, we can do well there as well. But uh, other markets could be California, France, Spain. So I think there are six to ten uh, interesting floating markets at the moment but if we look into a 2050 uh, perspective like you did Paul and uh, and if we're going to achieve the 180 gigawatts we will definitely see more markets India China and so on coming uh, 2030 and uh, and after that so so uh, in now for, for now we're focusing on a, on a handful of, uh, of markets but we obviously uh following uh, what what's happening in uh, in uh, in other countries as well oh that's 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 an excellent um perspective uh and much appreciated just going back once to canute very much it's very much of importance as to the the milestone of our industry floating wind is when we get to the next you know we're at 35 or so units per per field and or 31 or so in tampa and, but the next milestone is is 50 to 100 or as you say 250 to 500 really is the next you know commercial sized project so uh, just just want to put that out there and we'll let it marinate a little bit as we talk on uh, James on the key markets uh, what can you tell us about Shell's uh, perspective on key markets for floating wind I, th I think we're, we're at a slight disadvantage um, that we we haven't considered Switzerland yet so that's that's on the, the to-do list <laughs> now um, I, I, I think Arnie mentioned pretty much the short term and, and the long term. I mean, um, US and Asia is, is, is growing. Europe is a more mature market with um, bottom fix, but there are floating opportunities, absolutely. Um, I see floating really as a global opportunity. I think the real question is what do, what do we mean by commercialization? Uh, it's a really interesting area. I mean, it, when, when I, I think the inherent assumption is when someone says commercial, project it's scale so so people are conflating the fact that until you have scale you don't have a commercial project that one of the benefits of floating offshore wind potentially is not just um you know if you can get an industrialized floating foundation that, that is cost effective and can be fabricated locally pretty much anywhere with the skills and the infrastructure that exists commercial could be small projects that, that deliver straight into a demand center with maybe one or two other energy vectors that really satiates the need that floating isn't as sensitive to seabed uh, the bottom fix is so also you know your economies of scale well if you can your economies of scale are really going to be driven by your your installation and your your tooling for your first set of foundations you know if if floating there is an opportunity if we can get there of 5 10 15 foundations in a geographic area can be a commercial project that is cost effective and compete with the larger bottom fixed offshore wind. So I'm not saying that scale isn't isn't an answer and having, you know, 500 megawatts and a gigawatt. But, you know, uh, again, it comes back to bottom fix is driven very much by a business case and by a set of restrictions that mean going large always helps to reduce your cost of energy. There is an opportunity with floating offshore wind where we can also question that and create different routes to market and different delivery, which could be easier to achieve as well in terms of you know, permitting and consenting. Um, transmission, uh, the ability for transmission to be able to support large volume is sometimes more difficult than smaller volume. So I guess from a market's perspective, you know, access to seabed is incredibly key. Um, having a very predictable route through permitting, um, and it doesn't have to be quick, it just has to be um, predictable, making sure that you engage all your stakeholders and, and we're all, you know, experienced um, developers and responsible developers around making sure that we engage. But, you know, I think I think there's a trap that we say commercial equals large. And for me, and I don't know the, the view of Arnie and Knut, but 
I think floating actually gives you the ability to say you can start to shape smaller projects which have a system need rather than just saying it's one gigawatt, it's 500 successes, two gigawatts, all the like. I would like to stay on that theme just for a moment, gentlemen. Um, that, that's, a, that's a really um, fascinating area. Um, uh, Arna, um, and then I'd like Knut to, to chime in. Uh, James has, has, has made a good case uh, for opportunity, the floating opportunity. It doesn't necessarily have to be large. It can be uh, a small system and driven by the, uh, the needs and opportunities in a, in a specific area. Can you speak to uh, can you speak to that, Arna? Your your view on that? Yeah, no, I think it's a very very interesting perspective, and and uh, it's it's uh, when we discuss offshore wind and floating offshore wind, we're always discussing levelized cost of energy. This is the cost we have to be in, but we need to remember that differs a lot depending on what kind of market segment and what kind of countries you go to. But now we're, for example, looking into through a project at the uh, Grand Canary and. And we see that we don't have to be at the 40 or 50 to be competitive there because what they currently are using there now is, is diesel for, for the electricity generation. So, so it, it really depends on where you want to go. And I'm sure that there, is, there will be uh, various opportunities, various market segments within floating and probably much more than we see within with the bottom fixed. And, and supplying oil and gas installation is, is, is an example of that. And as mentioned, we, we're working on a project that, uh, on that at the moment with a hydrogen company. So, so I, I very much agree, but still, we, if we, this is going to be the under 180 gigawatts, we will have to be in the utility market. We will, we will need to have, have scale. Very good. Knut, do you have a, uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think yeah, it makes uh, absolute sense uh, what uh, what these two gentlemen are saying. We uh, we see from the project we're uh, we're uh, developing in uh, California, uh, the um, the power need in the Eureka is uh, is limited. So uh, so it makes sense to to go for a 150 uh, megawatt development, and uh, offshore wind in that part of the world uh, is a is a good balance with with solar. So you have a uh, you have a, a system that can can work for for that part of the world, uh, but uh, but we still stay uh, committed to um, to uh, reducing the the cost. And uh, if uh, if you're going to provide electricity at scale, then uh, uh, then then um, building that scale is uh, is what you will need to uh, to bring out cost. Very well. Uh, we have a question coming in, which is. Uh, actually uh, a good time relative to the, our topical outline and it, it deals with um, <clears throat> the front-end process I guess uh, James hinted on it a bit but um, enablers to government policies policies the regulatory framework uh, you know how do you go about uh, ultimately achieving a clear one way for your projects the the question from our uh, audience is uh, selection of floating wind sites, the requirements, constraints, and related matters. So um, uh, I'd like to start out there with uh, Arna and, uh, and provide your input on, I guess, sort of the planning process and how, you know, your lessons learned from, uh, you certainly did it in Scotland, but uh, in, in your own fields in Tampa, uh, but in the new areas that you're mentioning, uh, I guess some of the ones coming up would be Korea, Scotland, and uh, uh, the other areas. I mean, we we definitely see that uh, if we look at the consenting process first, that differs a lot from one one country to to the next. And uh, some places like uh, for bottom picks in Denmark and so on, the, the area is more or less cleared before you go in, whereas other other places you would need to bear do environmental impact assessment and everything yourself so it really depends on what kind of market you are in and we we we're obviously doing both and we uh we were of course open to to go into all types of markets when it comes to the consenting process and how that is uh, is being run and but i, I like to highlight that uh, uh, there are also other stakeholders interested to see and we we also see that now the uh, the issue of uh, coexisting with for example fisheries extremely important and maybe even more important with floating uh, with the mooring systems than than for bottom fix so this is something we all need to to think carefully about and act carefully uh, about 
then of course we have the economic support side of things and uh, and i think it's we look at bottom fixed um and look at the massive cost reductions we've seen there that would not have been possible without uh, any economic uh, incentives from uh, from government so so because of the uh, economic incentives we've got scale we've got cost reductions and now we see that more and more markets can can do without economic incentives so so this this is some money that governments need to put uh, to put in uh, up front jobs will be created costs are going down and it's it benefits uh, all of us yes um with respect to uh, the us west coast uh, we're waiting for bom boem to hold their lease licensing auctions, which we hear the second half of this year, uh, or perhaps selection the first half of next year. So that's an important development to, uh, to progress the uh, potential activities there. Um, on that subject, can it, you've already mentioned 150 megawatt project, the Red Coast Energy Authority, where you're uh, with, uh, in partnerships with others. Can you talk a bit about that project, uh, where, where that project is kind of on your timeline? Uh, yeah, the, um, this is in the uh, very north of, uh, of California in um, 400 uh, meters of water or so. So, um, so it's, um, it's a proper uh, floating uh, offshore wind project where, uh, where you will have uh, all the uh, opportunities to, uh, to ensure that you have a production system that is suited for, uh, for the uh, uh, for what the uh, this industry will need when uh, when you when you're coming into the uh, uh, next level beyond uh, 100 megawatts, uh, we're um, uh, we're um, probably not going to be too specific on the on the timeline. Uh, as you say, the um, we have indications from BOEM uh, uh, for, for a timeline, and and we will need to to get a better understanding of of how that is going to be uh, set out before we. Uh, before we can uh, can really confirm anything uh, on that, it's been uh, uh, it's it's been uh, we've been working on the project for for, uh, for a few years now, and uh, and we're uh, extremely eager to uh, to get that process starting. Absolutely. Very well. Um, I'd like to segue a bit and to uh, drill down a little bit further into some supply chain uh, opportunities and uh, maybe some supply chain challenges. Uh, when we look at uh, local content in the various markets where you're looking at developing or currently uh, have under development or looking at plan projects to pull to do sanctioning their final investment decision ultimately, um, uh, what can you tell us about the, the local content and infrastructure uh, and the differentiation between the various markets? You've already hinted that uh, I think all of you have already hinted that um, uh, the floating uh, there's there's a lot of fabrication capabilities in local markets for the hull portions. But talk to us about the the supply chain for ultimately building your floating, you know, a good sized floating wind park. Pick a sure. market, and, uh, and I guess give an example by maybe starting with a specific market. And how how you see that playing out? That's a long, a long question, right? I can take the first um, stab at that, um, unless Arnie or Knut want to jump in before me. Um, sure. All right. Uh, well, so yeah, I think uh, it's it's a it's certainly an area that I think is is open and ripe for opportunity. I think I think um, Shell's been delivering energy for a hundred years, and we do that in partnership with supply chain. You know, we, we, there's no way that companies like Shell can say that we don't. Um, you know, work closely with our supply chain to deliver our complex offshore projects. Um, so supply chain and supply chain partners and then fabrication, local fabrication is incredibly key to the success um, of projects. I think, you know, where the bottom fix monopiles, we can go back to monopiles if, if we just um, very quickly kind of look at the differences that we have. Um, you know, it, it's a certain foundation uh, technology that there are few places that can fabricate the kind of cans that the, or the diameter of the cans that we're looking at now. So it, you know, the supply chain is relatively mature. It's quite difficult to get supply chain to then localize into different regions that, that are outside that. So, for example, um, currently on the East Coast there are, in the US, there are absolutely plans to localize the supply chain, but they're very much driven around probably a traditional 
foundation type. I think floating offshore wind, mm. um, you know, A, uh, has the ability to uh, use existing supply chain and transition supply chain from oil and gas. It's much more akin to our deep water working around the moorings, um, around certainly the installation methodologies and the like. So there's, there's a ripe area for existing supply chain. Um, to, to really move into floating offshore wind. I think the real opportunity is to make sure that we take time to rethink the best way of delivering and the best localization of supply chain. Um, and I think to Anna's your point earlier, everywhere is very different, not just from a consenting permitting le land leasing, but also from a requirement of how much local content do they require? How much do they want? Um, you know, is it, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, low cost um, renewable generation, or is it um, cost effective renewable generation with a high local content? And that will change the way that you look at the localizer supply chain. But however it works, I think the real kind of golden uh, golden egg, I guess, that we should be aiming for is if, if, if we can come up with concepts that can be fabricated in local facilities that exist and don't require a lot of upgrade that we saw in the early bottom fix projects and can make use of existing skills within the population, you have the ability to de-risk your project because if you can fabricate a concept and it can be a global concept, but if you can fabricate that locally or do a high proportion of that fabrication locally, then you're also reducing your, your, your uh, transportation, your installation, you're reducing your need to potentially buffer, um, you're increasing your predictability of delivery. So. For me, in the US prime example, there is no, even for bottom fix, not just for floating, there is no real uh, offshore wind supply chain that is mature, but there is a lot of supply chain and supply chain capability. So the trick is not to just assume we should do things exactly the same way, because that's how we've always done it. The trick is to say, how can we make the best use of the facilities, the supply chain that are in existence, the fabrication facilities in each region to be able to achieve a low cost of energy that is good value and uh, goes into the system in a way that can be used effectively. I guess that would be my starting point. Yes, uh, well, new ways of working are certainly uh, important and uh, the opportunities of uh, innovating and, 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 and your different approaches to uh, ultimately a different approach perhaps or, or a combination of, uh, of things to uh, get it right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I presume that you're going to have a, a combination of local supply chain as well as perhaps a, a global supply chain. If I can, and I would like to you to see if you agree. For example, as an analog in the deep water oil and gas area, you know you can you can manufacture and produce subsea production umbilicals or, or for the for the for the floating wind or, or fixed wind uh, subsea power cables. Uh, in, in a couple of different factories and in, in dedicated regions like centers of excellent regions. And that's also done for subsea hardware. Would part of the supply chain ultimately potentially be uh, delivered from, you know, centers of excellence areas in the way of, uh, in what segments would that be? Would it be potentially the subsea power cables and uh, uh, that, that are manufactured and delivered to the project locations? Knut, can you take that one? Yeah, I think um, I think it's fair to say that you you probably already ha already have uh, these um, central centers of excellence established with uh, with the uh, most sophisticated uh, turbines probably being produced uh, in uh, in uh, most of them in Europe today for for offshore development uh, with uh, most of the uh, steel fabrication taking place uh, in Asia. So so that goes for the. Uh, for the uh, local content strategy for each and every project, you know, when when we're working in California, the uh, the yard setup is very different to uh, to what we see in Korea. So uh, and again, different to uh, to Norway and uh, and Scotland. Uh, so you, you got to bring you got to build on the on the strength of uh, of each and every every country. And then I think the beauty of uh, floating offshore wind in particular is that the uh, the pie looks a little bit different, certainly to onshore wind and perhaps to bottom fixed as well. So, the the chunk of the pie that is uh, dedicated to the uh, the turbine itself is uh, is probably uh, maybe at thirty percent. Uh, you showed slightly bigger numbers, but uh, but regardless. So 
without setting up a um, dedicated uh, manufacturing facility for your turbine, you can have significant local content uh, supplies into your project. But it has also always be to be the, the base case to produce a project that comes at the lowest possible cost and then and then you can look at if I if I uh, start engaging with uh, with the vendor A and B and C locally, uh, that would add a, a cost of so and so much. Would uh, would that be acceptable to the government? And I go goes back to to what the uh, in the end the taxpayer is willing to to pay. Okay, um, I think just to just to add on to that, I think what what what, yes. what certainly we see as an opportunity there is potentially. Uh, and I agree that I think that there are already manufacturing centers of excellence and there are things that would never be localized everywhere. And I think some some of that is just an education part of what 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 can you localize and what what can be cost effectively localized. Equally, I think the the, the communication or, or a lot of the perceived uh, wisdom, I guess, is that when we want to do something local, it potentially increases increases the price. And I don't disagree. I think there is potentially a capex premium for using local the real balance is the value and cost of energy is also based on the probabilistic delivery so so if you can mm. if you can deliver um, in in a very certain way that can actually help reduce your cost of energy so certainly from shell we see that there is an ability um, to use local in the right areas that also helps you to de-risk so you might pay more in terms of deterministic capex but because it helps you de-risk or make it more deliverable, uh, pr pr probable to deliver, so you, you're, you're reducing your uncertainty, you can actually end up with a lower cost of energy. And I think that, that's quite an important point for us. We, we want to make sure that we, where, where we can achieve that, we will always look to achieve that. Uh, we have a question yeah. from the audience that's kind of uh, related in this area. Um, maybe Arnie, uh, Arna can start off and, and speak to it. But it has to do with around local, uh, the local uh, fabrication as an example, or, or your local content and, and the build out of your facilities. Um, I presume you would use your experience from oil and gas, but you can tell us. How do you go about ensuring the local skills and competencies are developed? I mean, they may be there, but uh, uh, you know, whether that's welders or inspectors, uh, different, different trades, I mean, will the oil and gas experience help you there? Will that be something that you would have a head start on, Arna? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And uh, but I just uh, just make one way more. Want to make uh, one point first? I think uh, floating wind, you will probably see more job creation than in any other renewable technology, and that's also why we're discussing this. This is a great opportunity for all countries. And then, as uh, as my dear friends have told her, there there are certain certain areas of the supply chain that should and could and should and will be uh, global and then there will be also local uh, local supply chain and i can just give an example first on on our project hive and tampen um, mm -hmm. we have 50 percent norwegian content on on that project but that is not because uh, we have given contracts to norwegian uh, supply it's because they have proven to be best we have given them the opportunity to be uh, to, to bid for contracts, but they have proven to be best. And I think this is very important because if you give contract to, to the local supply chain, uh, they won't be competitive in the in the international markets. All of them are looking beyond the the, the one and single project. They're looking all looking globally. So they want to be uh, good there. So and then, then you, you you shouldn't just give them a favor to we would give them a contract. So so uh, no, definitely the oil and gas. We have a lot of experience from there. We're trying to to build on that when we when we do project, and we're always trying to strike the right balance, as as James uh, mentioned, between uh, being cost effective, but also in team in terms of giving something back to the society and 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 grow grow the local supply chain. Okay, um, that's that's an excellent uh, point, Arna. Um, can you? Uh, um, Canu, can you talk about uh, the, the job creation aspect of floating wind from your perspective? Yeah, we um, we see that um, it's, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, I think in a way it's um, part of your mandate to operate to to ensure that you're uh, you're bringing in the uh, the local uh, environment. So 
uh, and that that comes from from day one you know for ourselves it's extremely important to uh, not only of course have a good dialogue with fisheries and uh, other stakeholders that are already there in the sea but it's also about uh, telling the local industry that this is a, a new industry coming at your doorsteps uh, that, that certainly goes for Scotland and Norway um, and uh, I think there's been uh, there's been uh, reports saying that investments in offshore wind in the North Sea already in 2021 will equal uh, oil and gas offshore so so it's an it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, for the industry and uh, but they have to to move early in order to uh, as Anna mentioned uh, be competitive when when contracts are uh, are being tendered so having that early engagement with the with this whole supply chain is uh, extremely important to ourselves uh, and then of course uh, taking that through the um, through through the um, uh, delivery of the of the project. Uh, can you have a can you set up a dedicated uh, vessel that uh, is uh, developed locally, running on a, a more sophisticated uh, fuel source than uh, than diesel? Perhaps uh, can you uh, uh, come in with uh, digital solutions that okay, it's probably not going to increase the mining, but it's it's, it's going to make your project more robust and uh, ensure that your project is going ahead. Uh, we, we've got a little less than five minutes left, so uh, we'd like to uh, sort of wrap up, but maybe we can wrap up by talking a bit about technology and innovation. And you've already, uh, Knut, you've already mentioned uh, digital technologies. Uh, um, you know, technologies and innovation are both incremental and or destructive, or, or, or if it's possible to be both. But uh, I'm not a scientist, but I uh, sure admire them. <laughs> um, Arna, Equinor has uh, always had a strong technology focus. Uh, they're known for, in many ways, uh, particularly uh, in early years in oil and gas, of being early adopters of technology. Relative to floating wind, what, what, what technologies and innovations are you excited about that you can share with our audience? Many. <laughs> uh, no, I think... Uh, I think uh, Technology and innovation is clearly, clearly very, very important here. And we've already discussed, for example, one example, and that is the substructure. And as you, you may know, we have developed our own uh, substructure, the high wind spa. And I think it's fair to say in the past, we have probably been more into developing our own technology to use for our own projects. Uh, seeing now that the, 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 the market is becoming much more mature, we are taking a slightly different position when it comes to floating offshore wind and that is being a, a, a developer meaning that for example when it comes to the substructure in the same way as for the turbines and others we are open to use uh, the, the the substructure that is most fit for purpose in the in the market we are in so so being maybe less uh, interested in technology uh, development on, on that point uh, we are probably now that being said we we have a lot of uh, excellent engineers that understands all types of technologies and obviously when we are going to execute the project we we definitely need to to be on top of that um, and of course we have a strong r and uh, department as well but but developing our own technology as part of the floating offshore wind projects that's that's not core for us okay um, we're about out of time uh, but uh, do you have one quick last word James yeah, I mean, we I, we I totally agree with uh, Arnie there on on Shell. Shell doesn't look to own IP. I think for the industry, it's um, much better that we work to come up with a, a set of solutions, a set of answers, because I think it's stronger if everyone is developing together than if if one company is trying to develop their own technology. I think I think just kind of moving back to to the statement by BP, you know. I, I, I agree. I think technologies exist today. I think methodologies and installation uh, approaches also exist today. The challenge isn't just to, to, to put it in pace and scale. The challenge is how we responsibly develop and safely deliver um, low carbon power, hopefully through offshore floating wind at pace uh, and scale. And I, th I think that's a really important add from a shell perspective. That's a great um, last word, so to speak. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate your uh, enthusiasm and interest to uh, participate. It's my honor to have had the dialogue with you.
uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Luke to uh, wrap up. Sure, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everyone. That's all we have time for. Um, if you want to continue these important discussions uh, and more examples and case study of, of what's actually happening in offshore and floating wind, uh, amongst other things, do you head to the Offshore and Floating Wind Insight Hub. Just search Offshore and Floating Wind Insight Hub on your preferred search engine. Huge thanks again to our panelists for joining. Uh, I'm sure you found uh, their insight useful and stimulating and certainly food for thoughts. We'll be posting the recordings uh, within a week. So thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Good day, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.